Hi everybody and welcome back to video number two in chapter 11. When we left off, we were looking at an impairment of a patent example. And just to review, that patent had future net cash flows of 35 million, whoops, 35 million. Uh, present value of the expected cash flows was 20 million and the carrying amount was 60 million. So we're going to look at how we would compute that impairment loss and the journal entry. So first, Lighthouse is going to perform the recoverability test and the sum of the future cash flows of 35 million are less than the carrying amount of the intangible asset by about 15, 25 million dollars. Because the expected future net cash flows of 35 million are less than that 60 million carrying amount, Lighthouse must determine the impairment loss. So now we're going to do the second piece of that, which is the recoverability test. The present value of the expected cash flows is the current fair value of the intangible asset. So we'll use that fair value test to determine the impairment loss as follows. Our carrying amount of the patent is $60 million less the fair value based on the present value computation. And that gives me a huge loss on impairment of $40 million. So to record that as a journal entry, we're going to have a loss on impairment, $40 million, and a credit to patents to reduce those patents by $40 million on the balance sheet. All right, indefinite life intangibles. Uh, there's no foreseeable limit on the time the asset is expected to provide cash flows. In the case of the Nike swoosh, that would be the example of a, of a um, trademark. It must test indefinite life intangibles for impairment at least annually. And there is no amortization. So IFRS, from a global view, requires capitalization of some development costs. All right, let's take a look at a trademark. Indefinite Life trademark. DoubleClick acquired a trademark that it uses to distinguish a leader consumer product. It renews the trademark every 10 years. <clears throat> All evidence indicates that this trademarked product will generate cash flows for an indefinite period of time. How should DoubleClick account for the trademark? And as we, if the solution for that is, in this case, the trademark has an indefinite life, so it's an easy one. <laughs> Double click does not record any amortization. Okay, companies should test indefinite life assets for impairment at least annually. And the impairment test for indefinite life intangible assets is a fair value test as follows. One, if the carrying value of intangible assets is less than the fair value of the intangible assets, there is no impairment. However, if the carrying value of the intangible assets is greater than the fair value of the intangible assets, there is an impairment loss. Unlike the two-step approach for limited life intangible assets, companies use this one-step test because many indefinite life assets might never fail the recovery test, as cash flows may extend many years into the future. Okay, let's take a look of, it, of an impairment of a license with an indefinite life. 
Archon Radio purchases a broadcast license for $2 million. The license is renewable every 10 years if the company provides appropriate service and does not violate the FCC rules. Archon has renewed the license with the FCC twice at minimal cost. Because it expects cash flows to last indefinitely, Archon reports the license as an indefinite life intangible asset. Recently, the FCC decided to auction significantly more of these licenses. As a result, Archon expects reduced cash flows from the remaining two years of its existing license. Archon performs a fair value test for this indefinite life intangible and determines that the fair value of the intangible asset is $1.5 million. Is Archon's license impaired? If so, what is the amount of the impairment test and the required journal entry? Okay, the license is impaired by the following computation. The carrying value, $2 million. Fair value, $1.5 million. So the loss on impairment is $500,000. The entry to record the loss then is going to be loss on impairment, we'll debit that, and credit or reduce the license's amount on the balance sheet. So now on the balance sheet, they're going to report the license at 1.5 million, its fair value. Even if the value of the license increases in the remaining two years, they may not restore the previously recognized impairment loss. Okay. Accounting treatments for intangibles. So here we have a summary of that. Here's our limited life intangibles. We'll normally capitalize that. Um, we, if they're internally created, we'll expense that. Um, we'll amortize it over the useful life. And the impairment test is the recovery test and then the fair value test. But if it's an indefinite life intangible, again, if it's purchased, we'll capitalize it. If it's not purchased, we'll expense those costs. Um, and we can capitalize, as it says in the asterisk item here, except for direct costs such as legal costs. We can, we can capitalize that. So again, indefinite life intangibles, we're not going to amortize, and we will take a look at an impairment test, which is the fair value test only. Okay, purchase or develop. Accounting for intangible assets depends on whether the intangible is purchased or whether it's developed internally, as we previously noted. This is the case for the Coca-Cola company, whose brand value is estimated to be worth $69.7 billion, but its balance sheet values its trademarks with indefinite lives at just $6.7 billion. As you are learning in this chapter, this reporting results because accounting rules prohibit companies from recognizing brands and many other intangible assets if they created them internally. In contrast, Procter & Gamble, P&G, acquired Gillette. It realized an additional $24 billion in intangible assets on its balance sheet. That is, P&G paid $57 billion for Gillette and estimated the Gillette brand to be worth $24 billion of the total paid. So the source, intangible assets, sometimes you see brands on the balance sheet, sometimes you don't, was published in The Economist in 2014. And you're welcome to take a look at that as well as our textbook. 
So now let's put the, into practice what we've just learned academically. Here are the facts. Pershing Company was organized in 2024 and has the following transactions related to intangible assets. On January 2nd, 2025, it purchased a patent with an eight-year life. On April 1, it purchased, it secured a trademark with an indefinite life for $60,000. And on July 1, it purchased a license with a 10-year life, but it, it expires in July 1, 2035 total $630,000. So they want you to prepare the entries as of December 31st, 2025, recording any necessary amortization using straight line amortization. And Bravo at December 31, 2025, recoverability of the intangible assets appears assured, except that new competition has raised concern about the value of the patent. Here's the patent up here. Pershing estimates expected undiscounted cash flows on the patent to be $270,000, and the fair value of the patent is estimated to be $250,000. Pershing estimates the trademark to have a fair value of $75,000 and the license to have a fair value of $260,000. Prepare the necessary entries for impairments. And then finally, Charlie, indicate the intangible asset balances to be reported on the balance sheet as of December 31, 2025. So for Limited life intangibles, we have our amortization expense on patents and licenses. Let's go back. Here's our patent. Here's our license. The trademark had an indefinite life. So we will debit amortization expense and credit patents and licenses. Here we're taking the 320000 and dividing it by eight to get eight years, um, but the license was purchased oh, in July, so we only have a half a year of, of amortization, and that totals 250000 divided by 10 years times a half a year, or $12,500. Now, under Bravo, where they're looking at the entries for impairments, there is no impairment on the trademark or license because the fair value is greater than the carrying value. How did we get that? We first did the recoverability test. Because the sum of the expected future cash flows, 270,000, is less than the carrying value of the patent, 280,000, the patent is impaired. So the computation of the impairment loss, the carrying value of the patent, 280,000, minus the very fair value of the patent, 250,000, equals a loss of $30,000. So the journal entry, pretty obvious, will debit impairment loss on the income statement and reduce patents by 30,000 with a credit. And then finally, the balance of intangible assets on just December 31, we have our patents, 250,000. Um, our, our trademarks didn't have any amortization, so it stays the same. And the licenses have gone down by $12,500. And that's a uh, prior look at the patent, 320000 Okay, that looks like a good place to stop this video. And when we return, we will look at our next learning objective. Until that time, bye for now.